Good morning, everyone. Uh, just doing a quick uh, check-in uh, as we are resuming. Uh, first and foremost, uh, allow me to apologize for the abrupt um, switch over to the uh, timer. Uh, we were supposed to, I was supposed to let folks know that we were going to be uh, going on to a bit of a technical break to allow our production team to set up for the next session, but that kind of switched over before I had a chance to get on to the microphone. So my apologies for that. Uh, just as a heads up then for everyone going forward after every session, we will actually be taking a 10 minute break to allow for the uh, team to actually uh, set up uh, virtually for the next um, next program that's in there. So um, allow me to thank Mark and Claire uh, and everyone um, who had uh, taken the time to submit questions. Uh, I actually thought it was a very engaging dialogue. Um, two things, if you didn't get your question answered um, and you submitted it, we will endeavor to respond to everyone um, through the publication of the session uh, and the questions that were received with answers. And also, if you have any additional questions, please send it to fizraexchange at fsrao.ca and we will get back to you. So that link and that email will be provided as well later. Um, so I just wanted to give people an opportunity to know that we acknowledge receipt of your cues um, and we endeavor to give you the A's uh, and then any additional cues and A's, we will actually uh, make sure we respond to as well. There were several questions throughout the um, moderated session that was asking about the taping and uh, production of the uh, session after. So confirming that we will be providing uh, uh, the copy of today's session uh, through the FISRA website. So people will be able to access it uh, and uh, actually uh, replay it at their own leisure. So. A few minutes ago, uh, you heard Mark speak about the importance of principles-based regulation. This is a significant shift in FISRA's approach to regulation, and in fact, our approach in partnering with those that we regulate. To better explore what this shift looks like, I am pleased to introduce my colleague, Jordan Solway, who is the Executive Vice President of Legal and Enforcement at FISRA. He will actually lead you through this next session. Jordan, over to you to introduce our panelists and begin. Thanks, Glenn, and good morning. Um, very excited to be uh, honored to uh, chair this panel. Um, we have a, um, an incredible dream team of speakers. I'm gonna start by introducing Stephen Fuller, who is the uh, Senior Vice President of TCI Global and the Head of International Government Affairs at Travelers, Travelers Insurance. Um, Steve is a, a little bit of an international regulatory man of mystery. He's worked previously um, uh, in countries such as China, where he was count, uh, country manager for, for Chubb Insurance. He was Chubb's Asia Pacific Zone Manager for Marketing and External Affairs. And he also worked as the interim India country manager. He works extensively with international regulators, government officials, legislative oversight committees, and international trade associations. He's involved also in ongoing regulatory reform and capital standards in the United States and internationally. He's also chair of the American Property and Casualty Insurance Association's International Committee and an advisory board member of the RAND Corporation Center for Asia Pacific Policy. Um, please join me in welcoming Steve. Um, we also, I'm also pleased to welcome Simon Archer, um, who in his own way is a Renaissance man, a partner at one of the leading law firms in labor, uh, labor law in uh, Canada, Goldblatt Partners. Uh, Simon works with professional associations, trade unions, boards of trustees across Canada in negotiating pensions and benefits, trust administration, fiduciary issues, public interest litigation, insolvencies, corporate accountability, and governance. Um, Simon also was appointed previously by the Minister of Finance of Ontario to represent the interest of workers and unions in an expert review of the regulations that apply to Ontario pension funds. He served as a researcher for the Ontario Expert Commission on Pensions. He's also a director of Comparative, Re of Comparative Research in Law and Political Economy Forum at the at Osgoode Hall Law School. He also teaches at King's College London and has been an adjunct faculty uh, professor at Osgoode Hall Law School, York University, um, as well as University's King's College and the University of Western Ontario. Um, separate and apart from that, um, very extensive, qual ex extensive qualifications. He's also an accomplished soccer player, vegan chef, and he even restores antique espresso machines in his spare time, of course, taking a principles-based approach. Last, um, but never least, in three hours behind us um, in Vancouver, but many years ahead of us 
and her understanding of PBR is Dr. Christy Ford, who is a professor at the Allard School of Law at the University of British Columbia, where her area of specialization is regulation and governance in Canada, the US, along with international finance and securities regulation. Dr. Ford is a recipient of the Curtis Memorial Award for Teaching Excellence and also served as the Associate Dean for Research in the Legal Profession at UBC. Um, she's the author of two books. One, I would add, is a leading text on securities regulation, which she co-authored with the former Governor General David Johnson. Um, she also has, is widely published, including recently in the McGill Law Journal, where she wrote a piece on principles-based securities regulation in the wake of the financial crisis. Um, Dr. Ford has also co-edited the leading international journal, Regulation and Governance, and presently sits on the executive board and the board of the Journal of International Economic Law. Um, very similar um, to Simon, Dr. Ford has been uh, retained by governments, including the Federal Department of Finance, to advise on banking and securities regulation, and has been a Killam Faculty Research Fellow at UBC. So you'll see we have a very qualified panel that um, we're going to get right into it. And I'd perhaps like to start where uh, Mark's fireside chat ended, which is uh, PBR is obviously a foundational aspect of FISRA as a new regulator. Um, there is a clear vision by FISRA for PBR to use its statutory objects to drive specific regulatory outcomes based on identified principles in our statutory objects, things like promoting high standards of business conduct, protecting the rights and interests of consumers. FISRA also wants to utilize uh, PBR to provide our regulated entities and sectors with more flexibility in determining how they achieve compliance with regulatory expectations while remaining, while remaining accountable for achieving those outcomes. And um, the ongoing oper operationalization of PBR in living these principles in a way the sectors can understand. So my first question is really um, to you, Dr. Ford, um, which is, does PBR work? Uh, yes, but I think it really depends on how you build it. So uh, principles-based regulation, if you think of it as only uh, high-level principles, which are not uh, meaningfully enforced and, uh, uh, and understood in, in, in sort of a more comprehensive way with lots of attention to communication between the regulator and the regulated, if all you have are high-level principles without the regulatory structure to implement them meaningfully, then I think it's fair to say they don't work. That really just amounts to deregulation. If what you have is a principles-based system which has a regulator in place that can work with those principles in a meaningful way, that can collect uh, information from uh, the industry, uh, that can engage in a communicative way uh, while still being independent, that can operate in an outcomes-oriented way based on data, that it's gathering on an ongoing basis, then I think what you really have is a system that is far better than a purely rules-based system and that is more likely to achieve uh, outcomes that uh, are in line with regulatory goals. Thanks, Dr. Ford. Maybe I could just turn quickly to Steve. Um, because you've got a very broad international experience uh, working with financial regulators around the globe, particularly in Asia and, and the UK. Um, just to supplement Dr. Ford's um, answer, can you comment on your experience and really what are the circumstances that are best for PBR to be successful in your view? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> well, first, uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Jordan. And thanks also to FISRA for inviting me to participate alongside such highly respected and accomplished panelists and moderator. Um, I feel underqualified, but as the sole um, representative from an insurance company, I am unique. Um, to answer your question, I think Hong Kong is a very good example of a well-functioning PBR framework. And indeed it should be as Rob Curtis, one of the Hong Kong Insurance Authority's uh, senior most regulators, was the lead drafter of the International Association of Insurance Supervisors Insurance um, Core Principle on Principles-Based Regulation. And the, in, uh, the Insurance Core Principles are basically regulatory regulators 
perhaps the best example of a, of a successful PBR framework that I know of, especially since I've spoken to all the companies operating there, as well as to the regulator, is uh, New South Wales in Australia. And speaking of Australia, um, a big shout out to Canada on a great Australian Open, uh, totally riveting tennis. Um, in New South Wales, um, back to the question, there was a complex problem that needed to be addressed. Um, basically, the mandatory third party liability auto insurance sector had become highly litigious, resulting in very high premiums slow claims handling and minimal compensation for claimants. So basically you had a, um, a perfect storm. So in 2017, the government and in particular the Ministry of Finance took a leadership role to address that problem. The Ministry of Finance empowered and tasked the regulator, the State Insurance Regulatory Authority, CIRA, um, which took the important first step of canvassing consumers and then worked extensively with the insurance companies to get their recommendations, their advice, and their buy-in. And in that collaborative process, um, mutual trust was established. Um, and I think for New South Wales, the key here was first recognizing and addressing an, an important problem that consumers wanted to address addressed, and then setting up metrics to measure the outcomes. In this case, better access to insurance and lower rates and new market entrants were a plus for the regulator and a faster rate approval process was a big benefit for the insurance companies. Um, in the system, rates can be approved very quickly because of the excess profit and loss provisions that were put in place. And those provisions protect uh, companies if they lose money and they protect consumers if the companies make too much money. And again, I, I think the means through which this hybrid system was developed was um, early and extensive interaction with the companies and consultations with consumers. I think that high degree of interaction and then the trust that was earned were both critically important. And um, interestingly, um, all of the Australian insurance companies that I spoke to were very positive about their relationships with CIRA, the regulator. And for the public, CIRA continues to monitor consumer satisfaction through its call assist program. And under this call assist program, CIRA follows up with claimants and provides in-person or virtual assistance when necessary. Thanks. That's great, Steve. I mean, I, as you know, when we were working on the UDAP rule um, two summers ago, um, through um, your efforts, we were introduced to you know the Hong Kong regulator, the Australian regulator, and I was really struck, as were my colleagues, by how even though geographies are different and maybe the markets are slightly different, but we're all dealing with very similar problems with similar challenges. So you know, the um, your observation about collaboration, cooperation, the use of data, and fundamentally trust really resonates. Um, maybe just to shift a little bit, because um, insurance is an area where PBR has, in other jurisdictions, has been, has been demonstrated to be successful or effective. Um, I often hear that PBR is difficult to implement in statutory or regulatory regimes, which can be very prescriptive. And when I think of um, prescript prescriptive act, I look at the Pension Benefits Act in Ontario, which is a very comprehensive regulatory framework. And so maybe, Simon, if I can turn to you, as an expert in that area, um, whether you can identify or provide your insights as to what you think the main challenges are and whether you can be truly principles based in an area like pensions. Thank you, Jordan. Yes. Uh, um, well, just to jump to the conclusion, I, I think you can. Um, and and um, Dr. Christie outlined some of the conditions that are necessary to make sure it's successful. But uh, although it's a detailed code, uh, pension uh, pension law in Ontario and in Canada has always been a mixture of both principles-based and rules-based elements. And just to draw out some 
Obvious examples, perhaps investment and governance uh, functions are typically very uh, principles-based uh, uh, obligations and compliance obligations, whereas funding and benefit obligations tend to be a bit more rules-based. And there's always a mix of the two in uh, regulating the pension sector. Commissioner Arthur is actually back in his uh, 2008 report gave a very useful sort of summary and description of, of the mix and how it has evolved over time, at least in Ontario. And I think it's still a useful guide um, and introduction to the way in which uh, the system has evolved. And in uh, a principle-based modality, um, I think there are probably two major challenges to make success successful from the perspective of um, regulated entities themselves, pension plans themselves and their stakeholders, um, understanding their role in a principles-based system um, is a big challenge or can be a big challenge, particularly uh, smaller or medium-sized entities with more limited resources and capacity um, to take on the challenge of uh, understanding and developing compliance with, um, with uh, uh, the law. Um, they're also heavily dependent on the advisory community to do so, and so there's a challenge to uh, develop that dialogue with the regulated entities themselves, but also with the advisory community that's such a big part of decision making uh, in the sector. Uh, from the point of view of the regulator, in order to uh, make it a success, I think one of the big challenges is how to define compliance with a principle, and perhaps more particularly how to define breach of a principle and what's going to happen in the event of breach. Um, I, I, and I think Dr. Christie said earlier, you know, a successful PBR system is only effective at achieving the outcomes that we all want when there's a real apprehension on the part of uh, the regulator and the regulated entities that the regulator will enforce the principles um, and will have a strategy that incorporates guiding behavior through guidance and dialogue, but also by uh, detection of violations and promptly ensuring defaults get corrected and that's a big part of maintaining the trust and the dialogue that we've already identified as a key part of uh, principles-based regulation. That's that's very helpful. I think um, some of your observations, particularly you know that um, uh, there, there seems to be a misconception in a PBR context that you can't have rules and I think um, you've uh, you've successfully addressed that. Um, and also this, also this notion of scalability. Um, but one of the points you made really, um, I'd like to focus on perhaps Dr. Ford, I can call on you and that's specifically, um, you know, identifying what compliance looks like. And I often think about, you know, the old community standards test, which is, you know it when you see it, um, it's used in a different context, but in the context of securities regulation, which I know you've had considerable experience in BC, Dr. Ford, um, can you comment on how some of these challenges can be addressed? Sure. Well, I think uh, my role here may be just to uh, amplify some of what uh, what Simon said, because I agree uh, very much with what he said. And maybe I can just step back a little bit to, to also emphasize this idea that principles-based regulation doesn't mean doing away with rules. There will always be a place for rules and understanding uh, I guess also the distinction between sort of law on the books as written and law as it is actually implemented. So you could have a principles-based system as written. So you have a principles-based statute. Uh, the BC Securities Act is a principles-based statute now. And what that means is that things are often cast at a fairly high level of generality. Not always though, there are clear rules guiding things like procedural fairness. So so it's calibrated to different, uh, you know, different different situations. Will will call for a, a greater or lesser amount of specificity, uh, and so all laws and all systems operate on a continuum between principles and rules. Uh, but what uh, you know, but principles based implementation is really uh, it, it is really a separate thing, and it can take place even if you don't have a principles-based statute. And in fact, that's what uh, the BC Securities Commission did before it had the principles-based statute. It just adopted a different way of engaging with its statute and a different way of uh, dealing with industry actors. So uh, it started sort of as a default, default by not reaching for rules first. So it, it and it still 
starts by considering whether existing principles cover a situation rather than just piling on uh, with a new set of detailed rules. Uh, and then from there, uh, uh, there were some important shifts in regulatory culture that really followed from that. Uh, one was uh, um, this, this, this approach uh, really based on thinking about principles, articulating them in a flexible and outcome-oriented way in partnership I guess partnership is too strong a word, in communication with industry actors. So accepting input, having an ongoing dialogue which allowed uh, the regulator in concert with industry to sort of put some meat on the bones of those principles. And so that really required a few things, which, which Simon has already alluded to. Um, expertise, for sure, uh, a, a um, communicative relationship with industry, uh, restraint in trying to fill in the details by themselves. So, so lots of regulatory guidance, absolutely, but based on an ongoing conversation with industry so that the regulator has better information. Um, but then again, as Simon said, regulatory credibility is really kind of the bottom line. At the end of the day, the regulator has to maintain a degree of independence, a degree of confidence about its own uh, position and interpretation, whether it's talking about rules or principles. So, uh, understand, you know, having a baseline understanding of what a principle fundamentally, you know, looks like in practice, and then having the, uh, I guess, the independence and the support and the resources to follow through with that all the way through to the enforcement stage if necessary. Uh, because uh, I think it was uh, William Douglas in the United States in the 40s who said, um, uh, if you have a big shotgun before behind the door, then hopefully you will never have to use it. And I think that's the idea. It has to be there. The enforcement function has to be there. Uh, but ideally, uh, what, uh, what happens instead of sort of moving to enforcement first and foremost is that ongoing communication between a regulator and a regulated actor can help support that actor in interpreting the, uh, the regulation in a way that is um, conducive to their compliance uh, and that actually uh, is really sort of more effective for all concerned. So just th that's very helpful, uh, Dr. Ford. And I think that we've, you know, certainly we've been trying to follow that since FISRA's inception through our guidance, looking at our sector statutes with a fresh set of eyes, applying modern approach to statutory interpretation in the absence of having, um, you know, um, specific principles. So I think that's all very much consistent. But one of the things I wanted to, to pick at, if I could, uh, particularly when it comes to PBR, is um, this notion, and Mark referred to it this morning, of innovation. And I know, like me, you're a big fan of Scott Galloway or Professor G. Um, and he often talks about what he refers to as unlocks where you're unleashing a leap forward with a new innovative approach. And he's, you know, he often cites a whole bunch of these, including, you know, U.S. college uh, um, um, admission in the United States. And I guess my question is, um, we've, you know, talked a lot this morning thus far about the communication, about focusing on problems, on the feedback loop, on the community, on the use of guidance. When it comes to innovation, um, I guess, is PBR the right system to manage these types of profound changes to create these unlocks? Maybe you could comment on that if, if you don't mind. I'm sorry, were you referring to me? Sorry, yes, yeah, sorry, Dr. Ford, I was referring to you, I apologize. Oh, I apologize. So yes, absolutely. Uh, and uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about innovation and regulation in the years since the financial crisis. Um, in fact, I have a book called Innovation in the State. And uh, I guess my ultimately, I think uh, PBR is absolutely the right system for thinking about innovative uh, 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 private sector innovation and how to deal with it. And if you imagine trying to deal with a a uh, highly innovative sector based on a very rules-based, rigid sort of detailed system, I think it can be clear why that's not going to work. Uh, and, uh, and really it's because the rules are just not flexible enough, uh, not sort of capacious enough to be able to imagine new ways of doing things. And so a purely rules-based system is going to produce maybe one of a couple different outcomes. One will be that it will 
stifle innovation, uh, good, bad, and otherwise, because the rules just prevent any kind of flexibility or creativity on the part of industry actors and on the part of regulators. The other thing that might happen if you have a pure rules-based system is uh, that you will just get loophole behavior and circumvention on the part of industry actors, or people will go elsewhere. So, uh, so, so the rules will be avoided, um, undermined, eroded. Uh, you know, the action will end up being elsewhere, um, and the rules will not again achieve the effect that they're aiming to achieve. Uh, putting rules. Uh, in place in a highly innovative system is a little bit like trying to put ball paper on a cat. <laughs> it's, you can pretend that you're doing something really sort of comprehensive, but ultimately you're just you're papering over a problem that is not staying still for you. So a principles-based system is absolutely uh, the better uh, way to go if you want regulation to stay relevant, if you want it to actually uh, uh, be responsive to industry and through the communication with industry, uh, a principles-based regulator has better information. So because there is a, a meaningful communication loop with industry, the regulator has better access to information, understands what's going on, understands the challenges that industry actors are facing and also understands uh, sort of where the risks might be arising for consumer protection, for example. Um, so that is, uh, I, I think, in my view, really quite a, a clear answer. But I think the second piece has to also be uh, an appreciation that innovation is not, by definition, beneficial across the board. Um, to, to assume that innovation is always going to sort of uh, rot, lift all boats or is going to be um, congruent with the kinds of objectives that uh, that the regulator wants to see is, I think, um, uh, not uh, uh, not reasonable. Uh, understanding who's innovating, in what contexts, for what purposes, is essential, and that is the kind of um, information that a well-functioning principles-based regulation has. Uh, better access to. Uh, but again, it requires at the end of the day, a confidence on the part of the principles based regulator, so that you don't just end up ceding the field to private actors. Innovation uh, is always uh, going to have uh, uh, enormous potential and enormous risks. Any innovation of any significant um, magnitude um, can bring improvements for individual industry actors and for the public, but it's but but there needs to be a public voice there, and that is you know a a, a voice uh, that is interested in the public good above all, and that really ultimately is the irreducible role of a regulator. So there has to be a degree of confidence, resourcing, uh, uh, support capacity and outcome orientation so that there's some so that the regulator is looking at what the effects of that innovation are on an ongoing basis and then you have a system that really stands the best chance in a complicated and difficult world of uh, advancing positive innovation uh, and minimizing the negative Yeah, I always think about this in the context of coming back to our statutory objects and the ones in particular are, you know, protecting the rights and interests of consumers and also making sure that we're promoting high standards of business conduct. So I think that's that's a helpful response. Um, Simon, if I can turn to you, um, and again, I don't mean to pick on your sector, but um, Mark referred to some of the innovations this morning, but um, can you have innovation in the, in the pension sector? Um, and if you can, is PBR the right tool for that? Uh, it, sure, I pick on pensions, we all do. Um, before I turn to your question, though, I, I've i committed, I think, the uh, Zoom equivalent of standing up without my trousers on by referring to Christy as Dr. Christy already. I'm very sorry, Christy. Um, <laughs> I apologize. Um, but okay, pension and, and, and innovation. There is innovation. We can and do see innovation in the sector uh, right now. And it's important because perhaps I think the biggest challenge for the sector and big social challenge generally for Canadians is to make adequate and affordable retirement savings programs available. There's a 
sort of long, slow, looming crisis coming, and we've heard about it um, over over well, decades now. Um, and so that's a big innovation challenge for us. Um, and of course, as uh, Christy uh, has said, one of the big advantages of the PPR approach um, is the dialogue that you can have with actors, um, regulated entities, uh, when they come up with new ideas, ways to try and meet those challenges. Um, for pensions, it's expanding coverage, and particularly, um, even though it's a big challenge, defined benefit-like coverage, sort of certainty, predictability, affordability, um, those kinds of plans and benefits are the kinds of things we want to see in the sector and a flexible approach to uh, how that's going to be regulated and encouraged and a dialogue with your regulator to help achieve that is a fantastic tool and a fantastic opportunity to be used. And we've seen examples of that um, in the public sector plans in particular. Uh, they're leaders globally at what they do and um, uh, both on uh, investment side um, but also on making a uh, plan benefits available to more uh, employers and more uh, workers uh, in Canada generally. Um, there's been a big expansion of their offerings to folks outside their more traditional uh, sectors. Um, and, and really the only caveat I have to say to that is of course uh, innovation can be a bad word as well as a good word and distinguishing uh, bad innovation from good innovation is something that we really need uh, the regulators guidance on. Um, creative non-compliance is not good innovation, uh, we think, um, whether that's in you know, poorly communicated risks and some kinds of new benefit arrangements with seen in some target plans, um, or hidden risks or conflicts and investment practices that aren't quite well enough understood, um, and other examples like that. So um, it, innovation's um, a neutral thing in some ways, it, uh, but it can be also a good flavor or a bad flavor, and I think that's what we have to be alive to from the principles-based approach perspective. Thank you, Simon. Um, when I think about unlocks, um, Steve, maybe I'm going to put this to you. I think in our sectors, um, probably the greatest unlock is Ontario Auto and um, the ability to actually uh, improve the uh, value proposition to the consumer. Um, maybe, Steve, you can chime in on that, whether you think P PBR is sufficient. Is that the silver bullet for Ontario Auto? Or are there other things that we should be thinking about to, uh, you know, to make the product, um, to you know, unlock, unlock the value for consumers for the product? Yeah. Um, well, first, um, having worked in 30 plus countries across five continents, um, one observation I have is that the most effective regulatory um, regimes are the ones that feature truly independent um, regulatory agencies. Independence, technical expertise, and authority are the hallmarks of effective, well-run um, regulatory um, Ministries of finance may not always have complete sightline into the complexities and subtleties of insurance and reinsurance. Um, this in part is why um, so many in the industry fully support FISRA's new innovation framework, which I think can be viewed as an important pillar of a principle-based regulatory framework. Um, for FISRA to be empowered to hold regulatory sandboxes, to have the authority to waive certain regulations, to entice investment, and that's a major step forward and in keeping with world-class financial services markets. That said, um, insurers currently are not allowed to offer choice and optionality when it comes to the auto insurance product as it is locked in legislation beyond FISRA's purview. I think Ontario consumers would love to have the ability to purchase a scaled down, tailored to their individual needs, auto insurance policy. To pay only what you for what you really need, um, I think that has a nice ring to it. Um, but if FISRA's innovation framework does not allow companies to touch the product, I'm afraid there will only be marginal gains when it comes to the innovation framework at least um, for the auto insurance sector. Bottom line, in my mind, 
FISRA has very strong leadership, technical expertise, insights, and proximity to the file, but needs to be further empowered to deal with the auto insurance product if Ontario is going to be viewed as an attractive market for new market entrants, uh, for new insurance companies, and in order to keep the current carriers healthy, creative, and innovative so that they can provide the best possible service to Ontario consumers. And Steve, if I could, because that I think that's, you know, you're raising an important point. Is, is that your experience in internationally in other markets where they've been able to solve? Because I think auto is a common problem in many markets. Um, well, yeah, and I suppose the example I gave about New South Wales, I think, you know, they had yeah. a number of the same problems um, that Ontario has currently. And I think that whole process that they went through working um, closely with, with the companies and consumers, but also being further empowered by the Ministry of Finance, I think, you know, those elements combined help them solve that problem and deliver, um, you know, much better products to consumers. And, and has that in New South Wales, has that been a sustainable solution to your knowledge? Um, yes, based on my conversations just, you know, I guess about six months ago with the, um, with the insurance carriers, and also with the regulator, um, and also based on some of the outreach that um, CIRA, the regulator, has done in contacting consumers and really keeping, you know, taking the pulse of consumers. Um, you know, the fact that the, that the companies have excellent relationships with the regulator, um, that's also um, quite a, uh, uh, an important factor. Thank you, Steve. Um, maybe if I can just switch gears, um, you, we've talked this morning about um, PBR requiring a coordinated effort, ongoing communication between the regulator and the sector. Um, and from FISRA's perspective, we've been trying to do that through our guidance. And maybe I can ask, sort of turn the tables a little bit and start you with, with si start with Simon. Um, mm -hmm. Can you comment how effectively you think our guidance is? And perhaps if you have, can identify specific examples, good or bad? Well, you put me on the spot. Uh, um, okay. Um, well, look, uh, it, I think FISRA has done a commendable job of taking the existing, and I, I'm speaking primarily about the um, uh, pension space um, that, that I know best, but uh, uh, as I say, a commendable job at taking an existing body of guidance that it inherited, um, um, which was developed over many years and, and different approaches uh, to administering the statute, um, and they've been reviewing it and uh, reflecting the new regulatory approach in the new guidance, risk assessment methods, outcomes focus, um, and, and so on. And it's a massive undertaking. Um, a lot of detailed work with stakeholders has occurred. I've been part of that and I've been happy to be part of that um, in generating this new uh, guidance and updating uh, the former regulatory approach. I think on the whole, this new guidance has been helpful in at generating and sustaining this essential dialogue. There's been good dialogue with um, the JSPPs, the jointly sponsored pension plans, as was mentioned earlier, and there was a, a couple of questions about that put to mark. Also, in the um, multi-employer space, there was new guidance uh, issued uh, last spring. Um, I think it's been helpful in generating conversations that hadn't happened for a long time, if at all. Um, both at the regulated, both at the board table, the trustee table, but also with the regulator as well, an opportunity to kind of introduce each other and talk about expectations together moving forward. And I, I think it's been successful at generating those conversations, um, and so that's good. And also, even on difficult subjects, um, the sort of risk-based approach um, and the monitoring approach in PBGF eligible plans, um, which is of course contemplating failures at sponsors and and risks to a plan members and so a difficult piece of guidance to issue and talk about and I think that a good job was done there. 
I think in terms of big challenges, um, probably our greatest collective challenge right now, um, and this is a challenge across all prudentially regulated sectors, is, uh, is the one that Mark mentioned earlier in his remarks, and that's the climate change challenge. Um, we have uh, a lot of work to do, I think, to develop guidance that will assist um, uh, pension plans in understanding what to do about it. Um, and as I said, particularly uh, medium and small actors in the sector, big actors um, uh, may be further ahead in tackling uh, these issues. Um, but we have to, I think, and we've seen other principles-based regulators doing this. In the UK in particular, uh, the Financial Conduct Authority has been issuing um, some useful guidance, which is helpful to refer to in thinking about our own. Um, but, you know, a uh, review of uh, disclosure uh, and, and um, uh, uh, reporting to members and to the regulator what sort of standards at the asset and portfolio level um, are needed to ensure that the price signals are working in the way that is intended um, to meet the, the global and national targets. Um, and that work is still very much underway, as Mark said. Look forward to developing more of it. And I think that's one of the most urgent pieces of policy guidance that we'll need to see in in the very near future. So I, I think it's it's fair to say, and I, I've observed this, that your sector is perhaps, you know, the most engaged out of all of our sectors, um, um, given the complexity of, of registered pensions and the issues you're dealing with, because you're dealing obviously not just with providing the benefit, but asset management issues. Um, Maybe if I could turn to you, Dr. Ford, because I think this raises a really important question in my mind, which is, you know, looking at it from the sector's perspective, can you comment on what you think is the, um, what's the level of engagement that you think is the minimum level is required for that sector in order to really reap the full benefits of PBR? Right. Well, I think uh, thinking of it as a minimum uh, level, I guess I, I, I would say um, the more you engage with the regulator, the more trust you will generate with the regulator, the better your communication with that regulator will be uh, and the more beneficial that relationship to you. So you can hope uh, not only for uh, uh, for guidance in the written form, but also for guidance at a sort of a more comprehensive level. So, so really uh, understanding principles-based regulation uh, without the communication with the industry actors, you're not going to get the kind of effective system uh, that one would hope for. So uh, for, for, for folks in the industry, I think it's important to understand that this is really a compliance focused, not enforcement focused, regime. It's about being engaged. It's aimed to be, or it, it, the intention is that it be cooperative to the greatest extent possible. Now, again, it doesn't mean there's no enforcement stick in the background. There is, but this is, the point is that this is not a gotcha regime, right? Where the regulator is looking for low hanging fruit and is seeking to, uh, I don't know, catch you on some small rule violation. It really does look at overall regulatory priorities and by employing a risk-based outcome-oriented data-driven regime, you can you can be confident that you're not going to be um, sort of caught out as long as you're communicating with the regulator. Um, so, so what this really means is it's in the industry, it's in the interest of industry actors to really come to the regulator with problems earlier, to demonstrate goodwill, and this allows the regulator to really focus its resources, its enforcement resources on the folks who um, are real, you know, causing a real problem actors um, to mitigate that harm while not um, uh, needing to do that with uh, industry actors with whom they have a, a good relationship. And uh, I guess I would, um, I think of this uh, as being sort of a little bit equivalent to um, an example out of startup financing. So if you are a small startup company, uh, uh, there are a lot of them here in Vancouver, uh, and you will have uh, all kinds of debt instruments with various different lenders, um, as well as you know various other ways of financing yourself. But if a small startup company finds itself in default of a covenant on its uh, associated with a with a debt obligation, what they need to do is contact, you know, counsel who will contact the 
uh, lender and say, I think we might be in breach of a covenant. And that when, when that uh, communication happens earlier, the chances are, you know, very, very strong that that debt that that lender is not going to enforce on the covenant and, uh, you know, and, and require repayment immediately. What will happen is there will be a waiver, there will be communication, people will understand why the covenant was breached, and this will modify, um, or, well, you know, and, and the underlying debt obligation and, and, and lending it doesn't go away because there's that early communication and because ultimately everyone's interests are served by having industry actors operate effectively and well, and nobody's interests are served by having a uh, oppositional relationship there. And that's really the same when it comes to a principles-based system. So understand that that relationship is important and it matters and it is to both of your benefits. Um, I guess also understand that uh, principles-based regulation requires you to think about your own internal compliance uh, and to understand what you're doing to ensure that you have in place a system to prevent and detect internal violations of law in a timely and effective manner, that you respond effectively to them, that you communicate with the regulator when you find them. Uh, and uh, it's not about sort of the, the letter of the law, reading the rule without its spirit and uh, working to uh, just sort of uh, tick boxes on what you are required to do and not required to do. Now, I, I should say uh, this is easier for bigger actors with more built out compliance departments and more resources. Uh, so for smaller actors, again, get in touch, talk to your regulator, uh, talk to FISTRA, and there may be times when having a series of background rules or you know, that kind of clearer support is useful for smaller uh, industry actors, and, and that's okay. Uh, there will also, I think, be a transition period. And so it's reasonable to understand that there's going to be a time period during which people are working out the content of principles, building the relationship with the actor, um, adjusting sort of on the fly, and it will always be evolving, right? And so again, so long as, you know, so, so communication is in your interest. I don't know if there's a, a minimum amount of time that you want to be uh, communicating with your regulator, or if that's really the the way to think about it, the the uh, the way to think about it is that this is one of your relationships that matters, and uh, and there are real advantages to being straight up with your regulator in this system. That's a that's a great answer, and I think um, you know a couple things that really um, I I would focus on would be, and I often say this probably. People are going to cover their ears at FISRA, but you know, PBR is a it's a journey. It's not a destination. In that, you're never going to sort of be at the point where you're finished. It's constantly evolving. Um, the dialogues with your sectors are constantly changing, and your focus on um, on problems and issues. I, I come back really, um, or I, I would end where Mark Mark commented, which is, if you do this right, you're going to have much better regulatory outcomes, and you will reduce the burden on the industry. Right, um, but there's a lot within that to get to that point, and I think that you know, the staff within FISRA and the sectors have been trying to you know work with each other towards that goal. Um, the other thing I would just comment on because you've raised it, you know, I, I don't want anyone to get the impression that the enforcement function at FISRA is like the Maytag repairman. Um, you know, our enforcement function is very active and very busy. My colleagues Chris Zolis and Alyssa Sena um, can attest to that. Um, there's always you know, there's always issues you're dealing with, um, particularly to your point, Dr. Ford, where, um, you know, some participants, you can be as principled based as you want and communicate as, as much as you want, but they're just going to flout the system and you have to deal with them. You have to make sure there's public confidence in the system and that consumers are protected. So enforcement is alive and well in case there's any misconception about that. Um, I am looking at the time. I hoped um, maybe I could get one question, but I um, one final question. If uh, Steve, I can put it to you, but if you could try to just um, be somewhat brief so we can wrap up. Um, you know, from the sector's perspective, and you, you come from obviously the insurance side, um, what do you think um, is the best way to operationalize PBR if you're a, an insurance company um, or a broker or an agent in order to achieve those desired outcomes? Mm 
Yeah, <clears throat> well, I'll try to be very brief. Um, one method for operationalizing PBR in the insurance sector is through the own risk and solvency assessment process or the ORSA. Um, and ORSAs allow management to identify and focus on areas where risks are high and um, ORSAs allow regulators to assess the effectiveness of management's um, efforts. Um, ORSAs are regional jurisdictions in Canada. Um, insurance companies conduct, conduct ORSAs in accordance with expectations set out by the super, superintendent of financial um, institutions, um, the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, OSFI, uh, the solvency regulator, and each insurer will produce its own unique ORSA based on the complexity of its business and profile. I'm not sure if you want me to say anything more, Jordan, given the, the time. Um, no, that, that's helpful, Steve. I just, I'm, I'm conscious of where we are. Um, so um, I didn't think, but that ORSA is a great example of, you know, how you're using your own assessment and the risks in your business and adjusting it accordingly. So your capital is adjusted. So that that's actually a helpful way to think about it. Um, right. I, I'm going to wrap up just in the interest of time. I, I really want to ask the audience, obviously, <laughs> in a round of virtual applause and joining me and thanking really what is an incredibly talented panel of experts for their insights on PBR and uh, for spending the time this morning, particularly Dr. Ford, who's three hours behind and woke up especially early um, for us. So thank you very much. Um, I'd also say, this is clearly evident from the, the, the tenure of, of this panel that um, this does not work as a monologue, and so I would also extend thanks to our sectors for their ongoing support and patience um, as we work um, at FISRA to implement PBR and achieving our shared vision to get to those desired outcomes, to protect the rights and interests of consumers, make sure the market is sufficiently innovative and competitive, and obviously also promoting high standards of business. So um, I wish to thank you for giving us the time this morning, and um, I'm going to turn it over to Glenn now for uh, introduction to the next session, or I believe we go to break. Thanks, Jordan, and uh, thank you, our esteemed panel guests who joined Jordan today. I think it was a really instructive dialogue. Um, we are trying to maintain our timing for the event, and so uh, we're about to go back on break and we will return at 11 a.m. sharp. So I have 10.56. So we're returning in four minutes. So thank you for your patience and uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes.